There we go. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Giovanetti, and I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation. And I'd like to welcome you all to our Zoom policy book discussion today with our friend John Burlau, the author of the new book, George Washington Entrepreneur. I guess relatively, John, right? It came out in the summer, right? Yes, around okay. the 4th of July. Very good, very good. Well, we appreciate you all being with us. And uh, we appreciate especially those of you who made a donation as part of this event to help to sponsor it. We do appreciate that. Uh, and after this event, if you are just bowled over with the quality of this event and the quality of the organization and your conscience smites you and you feel driven to make an additional contribution to IPI, uh, our Director of Development, Addie Crimmins, would be delighted to speak with you about that. So contact her about that. For those of you who ordered copies of John's book, uh, we will be sure to get those out to you promptly. They're out in the trunk of my car right now. Uh, and if you would like to order a copy of the book, of course, you can order your own on Amazon. And John would be quite happy if you did that. Uh, but I'm sure we'll have a few leftover copies as well. So you can also contact Addie and she will arrange to make sure that you get a copy of the book. It's a great book. It's not, a, it's not an extremely long book, so it's not intimidating. It's actually a pleasant read. And, John has a very pleasant writing style, so take my word for it, you will enjoy it. Now, this is a webinar, not a Zoom meeting, so only the panelists will be on video. Uh, if you want to ask a question, though, we encourage you to do so. Down at the bottom of your uh, menu bar, down there at the bottom, there's a Q&A function that you can click on, and you can type in a question, uh, and we will get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. And we do ask and recommend that you ask your questions in that way using the Q&A function. Uh, yes, there's also a function in, in Zoom where you can click on raise your hand to try to ask the question in person, but we will prioritize questions that come in through the Q&A function. It's just a much more orderly way of doing things, particularly when you have an, a, a large number of attendees. Okay, so now let's get on with our program. Uh, when you think about George Washington, you probably think about the first president of the United States. Maybe you think about the fact that Washington voluntarily gave up his office after two terms, which set a crucial precedent for the country. Uh, you may think of him as the general who won the Revolutionary War and had to constantly battle with Congress to make sure that he had the, re the resources to do so. Um, today, unfortunately, some people think of Washington in no other terms as having owned slaves. And obviously, there's much more to the story than that. But what you probably don't think of is George Washington as, a, as an inventor, a businessman, an entrepreneur. And for the U.S. and our free market economy, it may be that Washington's leadership in business and entrepreneurship and invention was almost as important as the other things that he did for the country. And our longtime friend, John Burlau from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, he's a senior fellow there, has been for a very long time. Uh, John, John also has a journalism background. And so he has thoroughly researched and written this new book about George Washington, Entrepreneur. And so for any of you who are interested in American history, history of the revolution and the founding, uh, this should be of immense interest because th this is a story that's not been particularly well told, if at all. And I know that, uh, John, when you research a book like this, there's stuff you could put in the book and then there's stuff that ends up on the cutting floor. But uh, we'd, we'd be delighted to hear about some of the interesting things that didn't make it into the book as well. So we're very pleased to have John with us today. We're going to let John talk a little bit about his book and some of the interesting things he uncovered. I know we have some fans in the audience. I know we have some real history buffs in the audience, John. So the time you spent at Mount Vernon doing research and stuff like that, I'm sure that will be of interest to them. So John, the floor is yours. And then we will have a probably pretty active Q&A session afterwards. So thanks so much for making time for us. Thanks for doing the book and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, well, yes, Tom and Merrill and Addie and all of you, thank you so much for having me here. And um, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Tom. Um, yes, I am, I am here live from my couch on Zoom, but my couch and my condo are about in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, which itself has, you know, George Washington helped design as a surveyor. And I am about seven miles away from Mount Vernon. And thank you for also mentioning that the book is, is, is short. 
that I wondered if it was too short, but it turned out to be an advantage. Um, when I was on Serious Patriot with Stacey Washington, um, she said that for women, it's just great that you can fit this book in your purse. So anyway, but I think guys would like the, would like the book too. Now, um, and by the way, I hope all of you, you know, in, in, in Texas are, are, I'm sorry for what you, for what you went through and hope every, everything is, is going better. And it's just, you know, it's been t that, you know, on top of a tough year. And I really, you know, I, I've been, I've been fortunate, but I really felt that, you know, the things that George and Martha went through, the setbacks and, and coming back from that just in their business, as well as political life, I mean, can really help inspire as far as, you know, getting through, you know, crisis, crises like these. And it really helps to get to know George Washington because we don't really know him, even those who revere him. We think of Franklin and Jefferson as the creative ones. I'm generalizing here. And uh, I know that there, there are a lot, you know, in, in the audience have done a lot, of, a lot of studying, but Washington is just sort of seen as sort of the face of the dollar for the, you know, for known for, you know, giving up power and uh, leading the battles and all the important things. But I found um, he could be just as creative and innovative in his own way. And that's what the research that went into this book. And uh, I looked through, Washington never wrote an autobiography, although there was an official biography commission, but that unfortunately was never finished. Um, so we don't have the benefit of like Jefferson's memoirs or Franklin's autobiography, but through a lot of Washington's business letters, which were voluminous and uh, as well as that he kept every receipt since he was 16 and filed it neatly and made efforts to actually protect it on the battlefields, we can know a lot of like what books he was ordering, what he was thinking, what he was doing. And we know things from that, that he was, you know, he was, for instance, more well-read than we had thought. Now, Washington, of course, his, um, he wasn't as fortunate as one of the, as, and as well off as some of the other founding fathers. His, his own father died. Oh, I'm sorry, I should get I should put the book down now. Hey, well, John, he show was, it to uh, us, John, show it to us on edge so we can actually see how short it is. But then we do want to see your face. Okay. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> when he was when he was eleven, and his family, you know, couldn't afford, you know, further schooling, so his schooling really ended for him around when he was fourteen. But he was all, and and then he started out as a, as a surveyor, and would acquire land through um through through that through the uh, through you know seeing some of the land he surveyed, the wages, and would get paid in land, and became a real was a real estate speculator really the rest of his life, in addition to all the innovative farming he did at Mount Vernon, he recognized, and I know IPI has done some great work on intellectual property. He, Washington was early in recognizing both the, uh, the benefits of having a country with inventors and for his own thing, for branding a product. He was able, he quit tobacco in the early years at Mount Vernon when he thought, not because it was politically incorrect, but because he thought it was harming the soil and then he diversified his crops into hemp and wheat. And then he built or had built a uh, flour mill or grist mill, which they have rebuilt in Mount Vernon as well as his whiskey distillery. But he would actually register and he sponsored a law when he was in the colonial house of Burgesses to allow for the registration of flour. And Washington put the G Washington symbol, registered that with the Fairfax County Court around me. You know, there wouldn't be there wasn't a country, so there wouldn't be a trademarking system, and there really wouldn't be trademarking until like the late, as, as a part of US law until the late 19th century. But Washington had the idea about a hundred years before H.J. Hines, as far as putting a brand on food stuff, he registered his trademark at the Fairfax County Court in the 1760s, and then put the G. Washington symbol on, on all, and all of his bags of flour that he exported throughout the colonies, to the British West Indies and to the mother country of Great Britain. And John, to be and, clear, this to be clear, this is all pre-Revolutionary War, right? Right, pre-Revolutionary War. In fact, there's been some debate about, um, uh, uh, you know, how did how was he able to be chosen as general on the on the first ballot? And that's something that's vexed historians because you know, when in, in an era where you didn't have mass communication, how would people from other colonies really know who he is? And there's a clue in Adam and John Adams nominating speech for him, where among other things he mentions, he mentions the leadership skills in the French and Indian War and other things. He mentions Washington's independent fortune, quote unquote. 
So it, it, Washington was widely known as a businessman throughout the colonies. And it may have been people just recognizing his brand of, of, his, of his flower was one of the things that helped him become general. That <laughs> one of the things, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of research going on about Washington's life and filling in the gaps. But anyway, he, um, he, when he was, uh, when, when he had um, retired from the Revolutionary War, the first, the, making the first time he stepped away from power when he, when he could have been king, could have been dictator, um, he would do so again after two, after two terms uh, in 1797. Um, the era of inventors with Edison and um, Alexander Graham Bell that we would see in the 19th century wasn't really upon us yet. In fact, a lot of inventors were seen as tinkerers and crackpots. And I found that both as a private citizen and, and as a president with the administration of the newly formed US Patent Office, Washington was a pivotal figure in changing that. And I'm going to read from a chapter about Washington's relationship with, uh, with inventors. This is a chapter from my book, chapter eight, ch excuse me, chapter nine, called Father of Inventors. As President George Washington received many requests from ship captains or drivers of horses and carriages for permission to pass through secure areas without interference from the military or other authorities, most of these requests were routine. However, on January 9th, 17, 1793, he granted a safe passage request from the pilot of a highly unusual usual vehicle, a new invention called a hot air balloon. Balloon flights had recently been pioneered by a small number of enthusiasts in Europe, drawing large crowds and causing a widespread sensation. French pilot Jean-Pierre Blanchard had successfully launched short flights in France and England and had also flown across the English Channel. Now he wished to bring his air show to America. Not only did Washington allow it, he gave the visitor a hearty American welcome. Cannon fire at regular intervals awoke the capital city of Philadelphia on the same day Washington signed the letter of safe passage. At 10 a.m. in front of gathered crowds, Washington himself appeared to give Blanchard his pass and make a short speech praising the man he called, quote, the bold aeronaut. Future presidents John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe were also in attendance. After waving the flags of the United States and France to the crowd watching from the street and the windows of nearby buildings, Blanchard took off and covered 15 miles in a then unheard of 46 minutes. He would return to Philadelphia by conventional travel later that evening to visit Washington and tell him all about the day's journey. Washington was already well aware of this phenomenon. The craze had kicked off 10 years earlier when the first manned balloon flight was launched in Paris by the Montgolfier brothers. The balloon was up in the air for a grand total of 25 minutes and it traveled just about five miles. The public was fascinated, yet few grasped the implications for the future. Washington was one of those few. Despite Thomas Jefferson's assertion that Washington's mind, though capable of making sound, ju sound judgments, was, quote, slow in operation, being little aided by invention or imagination, Washington was quicker than most of his contemporaries to see the potential of man flight. Writing to French military leader Louis Lebig du Portail, I may have mispronounced this, in 1784, Washington made this prediction. Quote, the tales related of them are marvelous and lead us to expect that our friends in Paris in a little time will come flying through the air instead of plowing the ocean to get to America. So he's in, in, uh, in 1784 was predicting commercial air travel um, because of balloon flights. And a bit of a showman too, it sounds like. Yes, yes. <laughs> in fact, Washington saw the, saw the potential of many inventions of the early industrial age, and he gladly served as a mentor or booster for a number of other innovators. He championed inventors both in his policies as president and in his dealings with them as a private citizen. Believe it or not, when the United States became a new nation in the 1780s, inventors didn't have the best public image. 
As Andrea Sutcliffe explains in her history of steam power, many people at the time viewed them as, quote, self-indulgent crackpots. Fortunately, the individuals found an ally in Washington who viewed them as visionaries desperately needed for the growth of the new nation. In his first address to Congress on January 8th, 1790, Washington called for the, quote, introductions of new and useful inventions from abroad and, quote, encouragement of skill and genius in producing them at home. Congress passed the Patent Act later that year for the purpose, in the Constitution's words, of, quote, securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. In 1891, speaking at an event in Mount Vernon on the 100th anniversary of the Patent Act, Joseph M. Toner, an eminent physician and lecturer who had served as president of the American Medical Association and American Public Health Association, described Washington's crucial role in helping inventors. He told the audience that, quote, the instances in which Washington gave encouragement to new inventions are numerous and that Washington would always have a, quote, kind word of encouragement for those working to the end of devising new methods and improved implements in any of the arts. As Toner noted, Washington was likely sympathetic to their struggles because he had cried his hand in inventing a few labor-saving devices himself. In the 1780s, Washington made what he would call a drill plow or barrel plow by putting wheels on a plow and attaching a barrel to it. The revolving barrel would carry the seeds he wanted to plant and drop them into small seeding tubes affixed under the plow. The tubes would then distribute the seeds in the field at precise angles. The improved spacing of the seeds led to better growth of Washington's crop. The plow also helped Washington pursue his longstanding goals of crop rotation and conservation. In what had been the cornfields, Washington workers would put Washington's workers would put different types of seeds in each tube of the drill plow and plant corn, cabbage, potatoes, and peas all in one field with one device. Washington's penchant for mechanical tinkering combined with his knowledge of architecture led him to build unique structures around Mount Vernon to improve the efficiency of his farming. We have already, just, uh, during his presidency in the 1790s, Washington wrote letters to Mount Vernon farm managers detailing the construction of a unique 16-sided barn for grain storage and processing. The barn, completed in 1794 and reconstructed at Mount Vernon in 1996 from Washington's original plans, contained many unique practical features. For instance, Washington deliberately left spaces uh, between the floorboards to move the grain via ramps to the granary underneath while horses slowly placed, paced the white oak floor. The design of the barn made the horses part of the grain refining process. Yet it was a journey Washington took in 1784 to the Western part of Virginia that would bring him into contact with an inventor who would change travel and technology forever. Washington's purpose in traveling West over 600 miles on horseback and by ferries was both to inspect some land he had acquired, remember he was a real estate specular, had a lot of uh, undeveloped real estate, and to look for ways to shorten travel time through the Allegheny Mountains. He worried that the new nation could come apart if transportation barriers impeded contact with lands west of the mountains. Now, again, this is 1784, I'm going back to when he had just you know, retired as, as Revolutionary War and uh, about five years before he became, became president. Washington now, uh, of course, um, uh, to the extent it was possible, improving navigation through rivers themselves seemed to be the way to ease long distance travel. Washington saw, and others saw opportunities to make those improvement on the Potomac River, which spanned from Maryland's Western shore the, at the Chesapeake Bay to the Fairfax Stone and the Allegheny Mountains in what is now West Virginia, passed by the city of Alexandria, and came literally to Washington's backyard. These entrepreneurs envisioned building a series of canals to make the Potomac more navigable. The next year, they would pool their investments into the Potomac Company, a firm with special charters from Maryland and Virginia to pursue these aims. Washington also sought out new types of sea craft that promised speedier and smoother travel on the river. 
When he arrived in Bath, Virginia, he thus became enthralled with a local inventor who was designing a new kind of boat. James Rumsey, a 41-year-old builder and jack of all trades, was part owner of the inn in Bath where Washington was staying. In this little spare time he had, Rumsey built a model of a pole boat, which would propel itself upstream through the maneuvering of wooden poles. Many of the townspeople had treated the invention with scorn, but Washington let Rumsey make his case. Washington watched as the inventor placed his mini vessel, roughly the size of a toy boat, into a stream that flowed into the Potomac. Washington was awed as the boat propelled itself against a rapid current. Subsequent, subsequently, Washington wrote a letter of endorsement to help Rumsey secure funding from investors and patent rights from state legislatures. Now, again, there would not be a U.S. patent office until after the U.S. Constitution authorized one. Right. Rumsey wrote Washington, quote, has discovered the art of working boats by mechanism and asserted that this discovery is of vast importance. As Sutcliffe writes, quote, Washington's influence was golden and Rumsey approached the legislatures of Virginia and, and when Washington, when Rumsey approached the legislatures of Virginia and other states. Hey, As John, Virgin yes? I'm afraid nobody's going to buy your book if you read it all to us. Okay, I'm just reading this chapter. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, um, when the uh, when Washington's letter got Rumsey in there, um, and uh, Rumsey's original design of a of a pole boat would never sail as a full as a full sized vessel, and for some Washington biographers, the story ends there. They describe Rumsey as a failed inventor, and some suggest that he bamboozled Washington into writing his letter of endorsement. Ron Chernow spends less than a paragraph describing how Washington supposedly, quote, came under the sway of a gifted inventor with Liv Patter, hinting that Rumsey pulled the wool over Washington's eyes. Chernow writes that Washington was, quote, beguiled by Rumsey's ungainly invention. Edward Langle describes Washington's relationship with Rumsey with similar sentiments, quote, a dog with visions that the boat could be turned into the greatest possible utility in inland navigation. Washington provided Rumsey with a certificate approval. Richard Brookheiser declares flatly that Rumsey's boat never worked. With all due respect to these otherwise excellent biographers, their accounts of this episode are akin to describing Thomas Edison as a failed inventor due to his hundreds of unsuccessful attempts to create a light bulb without mentioning that the final attempt was a success. In fact, Rumsey would, would build a working steamboat just three years after he and Washington met. Many of the scientists aware of Rumsey's achievement have written in technical journals and not in the popular press. Meanwhile, the false narrative that Robert Fulton invented the steamboat has been asserted widely in history texts. Fulton did not invent the steamboat any more than Henry Ford invented the car. Both men modified an existing design and got backing to make it commercially successful. As hey, John, remember, John, yes. John. Let's not let's not read anymore, but let's let's sort of talk about it a little bit if we can. Okay. Well, basically, Rumsey sold um, uh, it. Rumsey's boat sailed in 1787, about seven about seven miles on the Potomac near what is now Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And um, though the boat traveled six miles, the townsfolk had never seen anything like it. No one had, as as aerospace engineer and author Rand Simberg has written. The steamboat was, quote, the first vehicle to be moved by something other than animals, including humans or wind or current. A shared past patent for the steamboat was awarded to both Rumsey and Fitch, Fitch by the newly formed patent office when Washington went in office in 1791. Rumsey would travel to London and meet Fulton, who would later get the backing to make the steamboats commercially successful. And just um, the... Uh, the way that the steamboats, Washington was ushering in um, uh, the age of the age of invention. Um, the uh, the steamboat sailing time on the Mississippi and Ohio rivers for the fifteen hundred mile voyage from New Orleans to Louisville dropped from twenty five days in eighteen sixty to five days in eighteen in eighteen fifty three. Furthermore, subsequent once the steamboat was made, subsequent inventors applied steam power to the nation's first trains mills and factories bringing 
Americans even closer through transportation communication. So John, let, let, yes. you're talking about uh, several of his inventions. Let me ask you, which invention would Washington think was his most important? And secondly, in hindsight now, 200 years later, which one do you think we would think is the most important? Which one of Washington's inventions are the ones that he, um, uh, um, or the, the ones the ones that he that he invented himself, or the ones that he that he sponsored? I would say I would say either one. I mean, he 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 would he would step up and say, I think you know this is what I thought was the best thing I did here in terms of inventing, helping somebody, or whatever. And, and so that's one thing. But another one might be what we, in hindsight, look back and say, well, that was really the best thing that you did. It sounds like he was more a champion of inventors than an inventor himself, right, John? Right. I would say he was an entrepreneur and an innovator, but he invented he invented the, the drill plow and other things. But he was a he was a champion of of, of, of inventors. And uh, one of the things with Rumsey, he gave Rumsey this job at the at the uh, Potomac Company, where Rumsey could work on his inventions in addition to you know to changing the river. So Washington was sort of like uh, well, both with his investment was like was like a venture capitalist. Sure. So you after, know, I, I go ahead. I think it's just important if I'm gonna, you know, I can read and paraphrase that you all, uh, some of you know economist uh, Deirdre McCloskey. I did a panel with her at, uh, at CEI and she writes that, you know, by much of the mid 19th century, the inventor had become a quote acknowledged benefactor in, in the world that this started a virtuous cycle in which more talented people would chase glory and riches in their quest to invent the next big thing. And what she said, quote, what mattered were two levels of ideas, the ideas for the betterments themselves, the electric motor, the airplane, the stock market, dreamed up in the heads of new entrepreneurs drawn from the ranks of ordinary people, and the ideas in society at large about such people and their betterments. And she notes that the lionization of inventors began in the United States before it spread to Great Britain and much of Europe, the Americans, then the British, and then many other people for the first time in the large scale, looked with favor on the market economy and even on creative dis dis destruction coming uh, from its profitably alert inventions. So I think Washington would be most proud that he ushered in the age of invention, that inventors were respected and that the steamboat did, you know, it helped bring the country together and reduce the time and steamboats led to steam trains, but Washington really brought, really was the one, and Deidre, um, uh, Professor McGlossky agreed that the respect and the culture that, that, respected, that respected invention and innovation was what Washington brought about and what he was trying to bring about in his, in, in his inaugural address. So I think that's, I mean, he would certainly, I, would, I write, I mean, he would certainly like, you know, like to see his prophecy about commercial air travel come true he, he, at one point, there's, there's a great scientific experiment he actually did with the writer and philosopher Thomas Paine, where they went searching and, and put paper torches in a river during when there was a lull in the Revolutionary War and found in, you know, southern Pennsylvania, right where the fracking is now, that there was natural gas there. And he would, you know, love to see that, you know, the, that this, that he found that we could light the river on fire, could, you know, power his, you know, his grills and, and, and gas. And, and just, um, and I think he would even be fascinated with cryptocurrency because he was, he was no stranger to private money when the, you know, they had all sorts of currencies in the colonies, the colonies and the original you know, uh, country. Um, there were things, private uh, illy issued currency that functioned as currency like tobacco warehouse receipts. It actually was for one, you could use for one tobacco warehouse, you could trade that and use it throughout the colonies. Plus, he practiced encryption with his spy ring that the the the, the Culper spy ring that the, the AMC series Turn is about, and Brian Kilmeade wrote about in, in his book where he used invisible ink. And Washington kept would always keep detailed ledgers. So having the blockchain as a public ledger, I think this is something that he would really embrace and be fascinated with. Unlike Janet Yellen, who says, "Oh, oh, we must be used for for illicit finance," and and then. Mm -hmm. And then she wants to cripple over. I, I, I guess I shouldn't talk about politics. Well, I'm talking about policy, not politics. Well, so, we, 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 we are we are a policy group, so it's not like it's inappropriate. Yeah, so, 
but Washington would just cherish the spirit of, uh, spirit of innovation and he wouldn't like politicians and bureaucrats who were cracking down on innovation. You know, you were talking about how before the Revolutionary War, he actually had built a brand, right, around his, around his flour mill. Um, yeah. Did you, did you come across anything like after the war? If Did he ever export overseas or anything like that? I just kind of wonder if the British wanted to buy flour that had George Washington stamped on it or not after the Revolutionary War. <laughs> that was, that, that's a very good question. Although, of course, after the war, you know, he could export to Spain and France. So I think, yes, um, uh, Mount Vernon would have a better answer. I, th I think, I think he sold he sold his flour, you know, and other crops all over the world um, there. Mm -hmm. And he bought things from all over the world when trade with China opened up. Of course, you know, China isn't the communist China there is today. He brought, he bought some of the first actual chi dishes in China from, um, uh, from uh, you know, in, in, a, in America. And he, there, there are records of him buying, uh, uh, purchasing uh, mangoes from India. Um, of course, he, he, he loved, he had his only trip overseas was the was to Barbados when his older brother Lawrence was was sick to you know to try to improve Lawrence's health which didn't which didn't help Lawrence um, unfortunately but Washington tried some of the fruits like the pineapple and he and citrus fruits and he would later have a greenhouse built at Mount Vernon which they've rebuilt in, in the 17 in the 1780s that that would where he could grow oranges and lemons and and uh, and palms and uh, and just all of these things. So he was just kind of fascinated with uh, different uh, different foreign uh, crops and food, as well as uh, as well as you know he had seen in a day when there were no zoos, he had gone to exhibitions and seen lions and tigers, and uh, and then actually was one of the few Americans in the early Republic to actually import a camel, which he had like just just for a short time at Mount Vernon. But every year at, uh, around the, uh, Christmas time, Matt Vernon has a camel that they do in tribute to him. So he was. You know, he must, he must have been known. a very. I'm sorry. He must have been a very keen um, agriculturalist, based on what you're saying. But also on the earlier observation you made that he observed that tobacco was bad for the soil because, of course, it is. Right. That's that's something yes. we've learned. That's something we've learned later on. I actually grew up in the southeast and tobacco is very hard on the soil. It, 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 it depletes it of nutrients. And he observed that that far back. He did. He did. Well, he would read books on agriculture. He would read. He would read. He would if he wanted to know something, he would talk to people, but he would also read something. I mean, people marveled at what a good horseman he was, you know, riding into battle in Washington said Jefferson said Washington was the best horseman he, he had ever seen his 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 receipts, his shipping orders show that he was ordering books about how to care for horses and books that do, you know, how to do jumps. A historian named Kevin Hayes wrote a book, George Washington, A Life and Book, where he carefully, um, uh, he, he carefully followed what Washington read. Washington wrote all kinds of, read all kinds of books around agriculture by the British agriculturist Arthur Young, who he corresponded with about things like crop rotation, you know, after the war and when he was president, and by a guy named Jethro Tull, who would become, uh, who was a British agriculturalist, who would become, uh, of course, the namesake of the of the 60s rock band, I think is, yeah. is still going on. And yep. Jethro Tull wrote some things about how, ways to plant hemp. So I was going to name one of my subsections until my editor just might have thought this was too cute or whatever how washington learned to do hemp from jethro toll <laughs> but uh, because literally literally he did he learned how to grow hemp there's no evidence he smoked by the way today they grow hemp again in, in mount vernon so no, that would yes. be, that... and of course he also read among this reading collection Locke, and we know now that he read and even underlined passages in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations that laid the philosophy of capitalism as opposed to the British mercantilism. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to Marilyn Addy and then we do have several questions from our audience. My, my last question is this, why do we know so, so much more about Jefferson and his, his inventiveness and his agricultural exploits and things like that. I mean, from what you say, it sounds like Jefferson just had a better PR firm. I mean, we, we think of Jefferson in those terms and it sounds like Washington has been really uh, underappreciated for his business exploits and his inventiveness and all of that. 
Well, yes, Jefferson did have better PR and Jefferson would write books like Notes on the State of Virginia and put and put pen to, uh, you know, put pen to paper about his, his memoirs, his life. Washington, I think Washington, you, you read Washington. In fact, one of the things he was first known for internationally was his journals as, a, in, in, um, as an officer in the French and Indian War. He was a good writer and I quote some of his writings, but he always felt self-conscious about not having an education. Um, and unfortunately also the official bio, he did sort of um, make an arrangement with an official biographer, David Humphreys, who uh, somebody from you know up north uh, who uh, lived at Mount Vernon, had served with him in the Revolutionary War. Humphreys, for whatever reason, biography was never completed, although it was pieced together in the 1990s and it just has a fascinating portrait of Mount Vernon as Washington celebrity culture where authors were writing to Washington to get an endorsement of their book and other things. But Washington's you know, genius and uh, his, his innovations have had to have been pieced together from his letters of which, and you know, it was hard to get his letters. Now, they're, they're, most of them are online, but there's still thousands they haven't put and the University of Virginia and Mount Vernon hope to put all of his letters online um, uh, by the middle of this decade, unless more are discovered. But I would definitely, the Mount Vernon Digital Encyclopedia and others are worth looking up as letters in Washington in, in, his, in, his, in his own words. So hopefully this, this, this will change. Also, Washington, you know, was when he died, he was one of the wealthiest men in the country that also enabled him to be able to free all of the, uh, um, the enslaved people that he owned outright, about 124 slaves. Whereas Jefferson, you know, and Jefferson had some setbacks, you know, with his, uh, with his, with his, with like, yeah, I think his, um, his, his daughter had a, had a um, bad marriage. He had to take care of his uh, grandchildren, but he, uh, you know, we see he spent too, and he also, he also, he died in, uh, in debt, and you know, only uh, freed a couple of slaves from the, from the Hemings family. So um, Washington was an, as, as well as, a, as the great in. Uh, innovator, he uh, main, you know, was able to really maintain that ledger and keep ex keep expenses down and uh, spend wisely. And just a lot of things, you know, budding entrepreneurs as well as budding leaders of the country can learn from him. Okay, Merrill, do you have any questions? Uh, you know, I think I'm going to pass it over to Addy because he, okay. he answered my, my question. Okay. All right, very good. Addie, do you have a question? Well, I wanted to make a comment first because um, I, I think just in terms of a legacy, Mount Vernon itself, if you have the opportunity to go, is a really, I think they've done a really good job of, of preserving that. You know, back to the livestock, the, the if I remember correctly, the, the hogs there are actual descendants of, of some of the animals that he bred and the bees are, are I mean, they, they have actual descendants in terms of the animals there that, the that he actually raised and... I'm sorry. Yeah. The sheep, yes, the, the sheep too. They have the same kind yeah, of the sheep, sheep and the hogs, that, and that was a that's a detail that I think is is just really cool in terms of educating people um, and this legacy. And I I would like to know kind of what your inspiration was for writing about this and and sharing it, and what kind of inspired you to to tell this story. Well, at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which, by the way, is CEI.org, which, have, you know, has been, we consider, you know, IPI a great, a great ally. You know, I write about um, my, as far as contemporary policy, some of the red tape facing entrepreneurs and innovators, like laws like Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank, how it makes it so hard to raise capital. And I kind of am looking, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, to show the ways that the U.S. is rooted in an entrepreneurship. Mount Vernon and Mount Vernon, all of their staff has been so helpful to me. I'm speaking there next month, um, you know, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, and uh, you all can attend uh, online. It's on CEI.org on, 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 on events. But when they rebuilt the whiskey distillery, I'm like, I had no idea he made whiskey. He actually built the whiskey distillery after he was president. It was one of the largest in the country. So I kept doing, you know, I did some more, a little research and found out, you know, and started writing articles for Forbes National Review. And my friend Jennifer Cohen, who had just become an agent, said, "You know, this would be a good book. A good book." So we went through some proposals, and St. Martin McMillan accepted. And I was just, and everybody at CEI was so was so supportive, and in, in giving me some time to to write this. And I and I I was and and uh, so I was able to put this. I was also able to discover his fight with the British mercantilist regulation, how Britain was really even 
outlawed basically in addition to the taxes really the making of nails they didn't want the colonists to make anything for themselves they wanted the colonists to grow their crops but they they wanted them to import all of the like iron works and other things from england and they would and they had laws like the iron act the hat act the bull act that gave them the power basically to seize factories and well, this is one of the things that first got Washington riled up when he wrote to uh, to George Mason, you know, fellow founding father and seven and neighbor in 1769 about that Great Britain, if they're doing all these taxes, could they then quote restrain my manufactories? So his 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 rooting the country in entrepreneurship and also a struggle with regulation. John, uh, when we think of the founders, we think I think of uh, cider, not whiskey. What kind of whiskey did he make? He made, well, Mount Vernon makes it um, from, uh, um, uh, uh, um, makes, makes it from his, from his old recipe. It's a rye whiskey and, and okay. I've, I've had it. It's, it's, it's pretty good, although I'm not a, a whiskey connoisseur, but that just showed how Washington reached out. Yes, cider was the drink of the day and Washington made sure to order some for the troops and in his invoice as far as asking for an appropriation for the Continental Congress. I have that letter quoted in there. But Washington happened to have a, a farm manager from Scotland who recommended that a whiskey distillery for all the surplus wheat would be good. And then Washington checked with his um, fr his friend John Fitzgerald, who had been an, who had served with him on, under him in the Revolutionary War as a colonel, a merchant in Alexandria, and had immigrated from um, uh, from the uh, from Ireland. Was also helped found in Virginia, a place where I just spoke. One of the well, the first Catholic church in Virginia, St. Mary's Basilica, right after a time where Catholics were discriminating the colonies in Virginia. And Washington wrote to Fitzgerald and said, you know, hey, you're from Ireland. Is this a good idea? Do you think it would sell in America? And Fitzgerald said, sure, give it a try. I'm paraphrasing. And so Washington did. So that's where, you know, he, he would talk to people far and wide, you know, with different experiences, uh, immigrants, uh, People, you know, would, would correspond with with people in, in Britain and France. Just had a, I have a whole chapter called Washington Social Network about uh, how even though you didn't have Facebook and Twitter in those days, he really had a social network with all the letters he wrote uh, hmm. and received back. How much time did you spend doing the research at Mount Vernon? I only I spent a couple of days, a couple of very productive day, productive days in Mount Vernon, but. A lot of it was online. I could read what in the Mount Vernon Digital Encyclopedia, which I would encourage everyone to read. And I would ask them, and they were very patient, like it's the, their histo staff historian Mary Thompson and others, just questions, and they would always uh, they would always answer them. But now they have um, the, George Washington re got his own presidential library on the camp on on Mount Vernon about uh, uh, four or five years ago, uh, where where you have some of the his early, you know, um, uh, letters and uh, as well as books about him, I used that and other things, and uh, you know, would saw, you know, that they demonstrated, you know, how they make the whiskey and and uh, and other things. A lot of great photos in there by uh, very talented uh, with Mount Vernon and some of these operations by very talent in my book by a very talented uh, photographer, Kristen uh, Kristen Murray. So just a big photo spread in. Uh, in George, in George Washington entrepreneur. There's the Potomac River. You can see it on the front. That's a drawing, but also has, has a lot of photos of, of Mount Vernon and a great photo like of a young Martha, Martha Washington. It's uh, very beautiful. So um, I would, you know, I thought the visual images were, were, were important, but Mount Vernon was great. I didn't spend a lot of time physically there, but I would go over with them so many times and look at all their online features. Sure. We have several audience questions, so let's try to get to those. Um, first of all, can you speak a little bit, uh, Brent Martin asks, can you speak a little bit to Washington's investment in the James River Canal? Yes, he invested in the James River Canal, um, as far, uh, which, which is, around, which is around, around Richmond, as well as the Potomac Canal. I covered more of the Potomac Canal, but I, I think the James River Canal might have been, I mean, as, as far as what's lasting, as, as, as I recall it, it's, it's, more, it's more successful. I mean, this, the uh, people would call the Potomac Canal, which I think ended in the early 1800s, um, a failure 
but it's only a failure, I think, in the same way that blockbuster video video failed after it after it was a success. I mean, people used blockbuster that was overtaken by Netflix, and and then it went out of business. Um, uh, and so the same way when canals were overtaken by railroads, um, uh, they uh, that they were they became 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 less important. Although I think in your actually your questioner might have more information than I do. I think the James River Canal is still used as far as 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 as, as important of the transportation more so than than I believe the James River is used more for transportation than the Potomac River. So I think that was still is you know really. Uh, really important, but this improved traffic and with invention of the steamboat brought the country together in the days before we had trains and before we had planes. So it, it, uh, it, you know, it bought America time for the other invention. So I'd say, I'd say both were important and it showed Washington sort of playing the role of inventor or venture capitalist, private equity, he would say. In fact, I would be happy to correspond with the questioner more about, I, I'm interested in learning more about the James River myself. So sure, I would sure. be happy to thank you for the question. Sure. And then we, there, there's also a related question about Washington and Lee University. And so what was Washington's relationship with Washington and Lee University? Did he bequeath some of the land for the university? I I think he would have, be, he may have bequeathed some of his shares of stock in the Potomac Company or other things. He gave um, I know from talking to people in Washington Lee, he gave some of the original, um, uh, the the original um, uh, money that you know, the, and, and part of it is what they're, is what they're is what they're still using it today. So, but for someone he never went to, there were about two other colleges and schools that he he gave money to. He also may have given, even though he was not Catholic, um, but he probably did, did give. There's a good trail on that. Some of the money to say start. Um, uh, St. Martin, excuse me, St. Mary's Church, which re became, because of his historical roots, the Vatican made it a basilica a couple of years ago. And so even though he wasn't Catholic, he gave a donation to start a Catholic church. So he was very charitable, very philanthropic, and believed in uh, very much in, in the kind of education that would, would, that would unify the country. Did you have any I'm, I'm interested in what the biggest surprise was maybe that came out of your research in the book. What, what was the thing that was most surprising to you that you didn't already know or didn't already suspect? Well, I mean, a lot of things like, like praising, like, you know, predicting, you know, commercial flight. Okay. But I think the main thing that actually made me um, relate to him, and I think about it every time I eat a pineapple, <laughs> now we're going to pineapple on my pizza, is how he just loved pineapples. And I would have never, it, it shows how history can fool you and that they were a lot more advanced, you know, in, in times past than you think, because I'm like, at first, how did he get pineapples? If, you know, if, if, uh, if, if you know, the US wouldn't even have Hawaii as a territory until uh, the, 19th, the 19th century. But of course, the, the, the Barbados had pineapples, you know, being a, and they were a British colony and he went there and he would, he would, he would order pineapples for the rest of his life so that, just showed sort of what, you know, a Renaissance worldly um, self-educated man he was, that he, he just would love foods, you know, that you, uh, uh, that were not native to Virginia, like, like pineapples. We have a, another question uh, from Jack Tatum. Jack Tatum wants to know, were there any other agricultural products that Washington produced and that he exported, you know, to any great extent other than just the flour? Well, the, I, I mean, of, of course, all of the, um, uh, I mean, everything was, a lot of crops, you know, especially in the colonial days were basically for export, for export to Great Britain. That's how tobacco planters would get money. Washington, one of the reasons Washington wanted to do wheat, um, in addition to um, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the tobacco was harming the soil, was that he wouldn't have to go through the British bureaucracy of Duty, you know, duties and taxes and the shippers that there was more of a domestic market for wheat, but then he exported the wheat and exported the flour too. So, I mean, he grew hundreds of crops in Mount, in Mount Vernon. And I assume, oh, 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 I mean, certainly he had a big fishery in, in, uh, in, in, Mount, in, in sorry, in herring and, and shad, and he also exported that. So, so fish, I mean, def uh, definitely, and then and then the way he would integrate his enterprise, the unusual parts of the, of the fish, the fish gut, he would then use for fertilizer. Hmm. 
The Mount Vernon complex today must be much smaller than it was in his day. Is that right? Some of the land I, sold off? Yes, it's it's just basically, he originally had five farms and um, it is basically one farm with the mansion house today, although it is still pretty big. That's why when they built the whiskey distillery and the grist mill on the, on the old, where they thought the, you know, the old land was, it's actually, it's not um, uh, connected with the uh, Mount Vernon farm. Mount Vernon um, uh, has, has buses that, 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 that take, that take you there because there are houses and, and other things uh, in between that all part of the original Mount Vernon, you know, Mount Vernon itself is an entrepreneurial story that say in the 1850s, it was going into disrepair and, a lady named, you know, Ann Cunningham sort of saw it from a riverboat and she was like, well, if the men can't uh, maintain this, maybe the women can. So they raised money, formed what is still the Ladies League of Mount Vernon that, that governs, governs it, run, run by women, and have not taken a dime of government money, all private. And they, and they have, not only they've rebuilt the whiskey distillery in, in, recent, in recent years in the grist mill, they have things like a 4D theater where it's like B Washington, where you know, it's it's what's well, forty. It's you know you see it like in three D, and then you can feel like the rain in like a wet battle or a battle like the Battle of Trenton. So it's just an, it's just an amazing uh, an amazing place that uh, you know celebrate it has has research and you know preserves it yet also has interactive museums and other things that that and the Washington Library that celebrate Washington and, and offer such assistance to scholars. Cool. Um, we're going to take one last audience question that just came in. Um, uh, Jeff Mazar wants to know about the currency that was used when he was selling his weed and whiskey, uh, because there was no real common U.S. currency at that point, right? So how did they transact business? What did they use for currency? Was it a variety of currencies? A variety of currencies. The Spanish dollar was was one of the was one of the things that was used. I mean, the British would not let them. You know, um, uh, I'm talking about in the colonial days. The British would not. Um, they would not let the colonists print their own 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 money. Which you know, there were reasons for that. That was inflationary. But they would also not let them build mints or mint money into into British currency. So there was a shortage of that. Sometimes. People would just pay each other in, in land. Washington would receive land from surveying. But one of the most fascinating things, and historians like Forrest McDonald have written about this, that that tobacco warehouse receipts, where you know you where people would give you a receipt for amount of, for amount of tobacco, that sort of was the cryptocurrency of its day. That it became you know a national functioning currency both in the colonial days and in the early days days of the republic. Hmm. So I, when I talk about, you know, and I, I am doing some writing on cryptocurrency, you can find it at CEI.org. I, I did a paper on it and I'm saying that that was, you know, we've always sort of had alternative money that, that, that could, when there needed to be currency to complement what the state back currency couldn't do. So a tobacco warehouse receipts, that's one of the things I found, I, I found fascinating. I mean, yep. to answer your other question. So they use so they use the Spanish currency. They used tobacco receipts. Uh, was was gold used at that time in any form as a form of currency or medium of exchange? I think it was, but recall, I mean, there were no gold deposits, and and uh, people had gold. There were no gold deposits. I mean, California wasn't wasn't a part of the union, so it was it was very gold and silver were very limited use in okay. use as currency. Okay. John, do you have any closing comments about your book? And then we'll wrap things up. Well, just that my book is- uh, Yeah, other, 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 other than buy it, right? Yes, it's available <laughs> for, for sale. Um, I, am at Mount, I, am at, I am at Mount Vernon, uh, March 17th. The, the events page on CEI.org has, has some future talks I am. And I hope I right. get as half a good as, you know, reception and hospitality as, as you guys have, have shown for- those in DC or listen to WMAL, I'm on Larry O'Connor tomorrow. I should be, although this was postponed and it may be again on Washington Journal this Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Central. So the book is, make, is making, in fact, if you want to call into Washington Journal so I can get some good questions and non, you know, um, uh, you know the questions that aren't necessarily off off topic or, or from the, or from some, you know, as you mentioned, the, uh, 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 the, the haters um, right. I, I would 
I would appreciate it. So you'll, pro you'll probably get your share of haters. Well, we have several comments in the chat about the how interesting the conversation was. Uh, one person in the chat says he's more interested in visiting Mount Vernon next time he's in DC and he'll be better informed when he does so. So you, you've performed a public service and we really appreciate it, John. Thanks so much. And as I Thank said, uh, as I said earlier, uh, if you'd like to get a copy of John's book, uh, contact Addie Crimmins and she'll be glad to arrange for us to get you a copy. John, thanks so much. We appreciate it. And thank you for your kind words about uh, all of the weather here in Texas last week. We're, we're, we're largely recovered from that other than damaged carpets and broken pipes. But uh, thank you so much for your good wishes. And with that, uh, Dr. Merrill Matthews and Addie Crimmins and Tom Giovanetti, we thank you all for joining us. And we wish you a good rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. And letting me talk about George Washington Entrepreneur. Absolutely.